Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Hello, hello. Good afternoon. Hope everyone can hear me. My name is Leif. I'm from Seven Peaks Software. And I would just like to do a... Oh. Nice to have an applause before you talk. That's always positive. I just want to make a brief introduction to the company before we have the actual speakers uh, on the place afterwards. Seven Peaks Software, founded in 2009, been in Bangkok since 2014. We're now 64 people. We have offices both in Thailand and in uh, Norway. And it's increasing our nationalities every year. Now we have around 16 nationalities. One of our strengths is that we have a very senior team, a mix of both Thais and expats. This is our tech leads, and as you can see, we have a, an average about 11, 12 years of experience within the team that makes a, that's a very strong team. Uh, in the development teams, we have a mix of expats and Thais also there, around 50-50. Basically, we work with clients all over the world, mostly enterprise clients, and we are within all kinds of industries, so we are not focusing on every, any specific industry. We are quite industry agnostic. So hopefully you recognize some of the big brands here. We work both with big banking, telecom, finance. We also get some good help from the consultant companies and within various uh, oil and retail. So basically what we, what we do is that we, we want to be a long-term partner. We don't want to go in and maybe do a one or two month project and then finish. We want to be a part from start to finish. We start by finding out what you actually need, doing the design discoveries, coming up with requirements. Then we build uh, the systems during development, QA. And then, of course, afterwards is a maintenance. We do the support. And then one very important factor is that you also need to learn by the numbers you're gathering, by the different analytics, big data, then we find out what works, what doesn't work, we change, we improve, and then we help manu manage the growth for the software we're developing. So basically we are a partner from start to end, and kind of our average contracts with our clients is three years. So that means that we're far from the two month in, just do something and then get out. We have different commercial models, all from the turnkey pro um, products where we basically do everything. We deliver the product finished to you. We have product teams where often you have the product owner on your side and we assist with a PM assisting product owner on our side and the development team. And we can also help you if you have an existing development team, you, you just need a bit more people, then we can extend your team and work completely under your process and un under your priorities. And we can also do staff augmentation where we actually sit uh, in your office as part of your development teams. So we have different kind of flexible commercial models for every need. So this is some of the key points why it's wise to work with Seven Peaks. We have almost six years experience in average. That is including everything from juniors to seniors. Then we have around six years experience. The management team is uh, over 15 years experience. As I said, we're mostly working over three years with, with our technology customers. We have uh, a talent pool of 2,500 people, and we are quite strict on hiring. So in 2019, we hired 2% of the candidates that applied. And of course, we think that it's a big advantage to be, be multicultural and have all these different nationalities working together, then we get, to get the best product. Enough about Seven Peaks. Today we have a meetup about cloud migration. You will have different tips and uh, best practices for how you can migrate your business into the cloud. We have everything from the technical focus, but also some, some business focus. And we're very lucky that Alibaba has uh, uh, sponsored us tonight, and they also have one speaker, so we get some speakers from Seven Peaks, but we also have speakers 
and some pizza and stuff like that from Alibaba. So hopefully it will be a good good afternoon. I hope you also ask uh, a lot of questions to our speakers so they can be maybe challenged a bit also. So with that in mind, the short introduction is over and I think uh, Giorgio, are you the first speaker? Yes. So then I'll, then I'll leave the table here to Giorgio. We wait uh, for the technical operation. <coughs> okay, good afternoon and evening again. Uh, okay, I am here to uh, speak about uh, migrate uh, your uh, business uh, in, in the cloud. So uh, this is myself. Uh, I work uh, in uh, IT from uh, 2006. I cover these different uh, roles, and uh, I am uh, here in Seven Peaks uh, as a tech lead of the cloud solution. This is our certification for our cloud team in uh, Azure and uh, in uh, AWS. And this is the agenda for today. I give you I divide the agenda on uh, two main topics, and uh, I will show you two cases from uh, our customer. Of course, I cannot say the name of the customer, and uh, I need to hide some information, but I try to give you the uh, meaning and the benefit uh, and all the other features that uh, the our customer take uh, from the uh, cloud migration or migrate their business into the cloud. Okay, first point of the agenda. Why should migrate to the cloud? Scalability is uh, something that uh, belongs uh, to the resource allocation, physically and not physically. So what I mean, the hardware and the people to manage that. More is automated, less people do you need, less cost, less cost uh, you should have. Mobility, what I mean as a uh, mobility, the downtime. Often when you are uh, in production, uh, or for example for some kind of product, some kind of public product that uh, is uh, have uh, an unpredictable traffic, for example, like the Black Friday in uh, Lazada, for example, the downtime in the cloud uh, is tried to reduce to zero. So the expression, the downtime, is only by you because you are doing something that can be automated in the cloud and the downtime should be zero or 0 0.1, okay. Affordability, what I mean as affordability is pays as you go. Pay how much resource, services, or software I'm using. This is the now the standard model for every public cloud. The solution of the inside, the private cloud, uh, don't have uh, this uh, functionality developed so well until uh, you don't have uh, a team that manage uh, all the issue regarding the uh, hardware team, uh, security, and so on in your private cloud. The security, this is uh, the most uh, important thing here. The cloud, uh, when you, you need to manage a cloud or the public cloud provider, manage for you the, secu the security about the procedures, processes, and compliances. You can go in uh, AWS, Azure, uh, and Google Cloud, uh, and you can find uh, the list of the compliances that maybe you are looking for. They already cover for you. It's not you that need to think allocated budget for that people a uh, resource to do that. They already give to you the compliances, explain you how you use uh, their service to be compliant, and uh, hopefully, develop your what you have to develop. The looking for about control or better the 
measure what's happened, that is the illusion of the control. So looking for what's happened now. I have my account in my uh, AWS or uh, Google or Azure. I want to understand what's up now. It's not uh, 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 ideally is, is the unified dashboard to see both the uh, behavior of the resource and uh, the money and the effort that now I'm spending to do that. Okay, I give you some data about uh, the migration to the cloud. 93% in this year of the enterprise have a multi-cloud strategy. Multi-cloud means that they have uh, a service in AWS and other services uh, into Azure or Google Cloud. They choose to migrate several kind of uh, service into the specific cloud because this, this kind of cloud give them the best uh, return of the investment. It's not strange in the enterprise have uh, this model. I choose uh, Azure because it's integrated with my Active Directory example. I choose uh, Google because uh, my not legacy application works on the Kubernetes. Kubernetes born into the uh, Google. They are a lot, tons of uh, experience, uh, tons of service that help to do that. Or I go in uh, AWS because I want, the, for example, some kind of uh, interface uh, with uh, integration of the system that I already have or the part of the legacy that I need to host. It's not strange. 87% has uh, a hybrid cloud strategy, multi-cloud and public and private cloud. 87%, this is this number, honestly, when I find this number, uh, this scared me a lot because this uh, means that a lot of company have something uh, on-premise because they have their data center before and they start to migrate in the cloud what should be in the cloud. And this is a lot. <laughs> and the last is 20 of enterprises spend more than 12 million of US dollar per year into the public cloud. So this number, the laser, okay, this number justify this number per year. This is something when I see this data, I <laughs> say, okay, we are on the right track. <laughs> How to migrate to the cloud? Now I explain to you why. I give you the main reasons to migrate your business to the cloud. Now I explain, uh, not in the detail of uh, the uh, development or the infrastructure team, but I give you the, some kind of guideline tips or procedure to move to the cloud. Forgot the classic model of the data center. The data center is the base of the cloud. The cloud already has the data center. Think to the service, not to the infrastructure. I need uh, the web published, uh, my web page published in the SharePoint. Stop. This is what I want. I don't need to think, okay, I need to do that, I need to route that, I need to have this network, I need to have this storage, and so on. I want my page on SharePoint. Stop. I don't need to think as the old way. I need to divide this, it should be that, should be that, should be that. This is one of the uh, let me say, common practice, sometimes here in Thailand or with our customer international, that they have a mind set or better. Their teams, technical team, have the mind set into the old data center that they have. When you step to the cloud, you are in, a, let me say, in another world. They manage this for you. It means that they work for you and you start to work again on the stuff that they already done. Do the job twice. Solution 
focus pattern. Choose if you don't have, train your team, train your infrastructure to be cloud ready. If uh, you cannot afford this kind of expertise, knowledge, or technicality, choose the right solution focus partner. As example as before, I want my web page on SharePoint. I want to create that. There is a, in uh, all the cloud, uh, you can see the well architected framework. There is the main principle about how should be your cloud solution. You need to cover the cost optimization, uh, reliability, scalability, security, what I say you before. And I want my page on the SharePoint. <laughs> the control management, cost, time, and resource. The first triangle of the project management or product management is the choose the right way or your way. Right is a bit wrong. Choose the right way for you to manage this uh, page into the SharePoint. I don't want, uh, I need want only one page, I don't need a cluster. Maybe one SharePoint server is enough for one page. Okay, we can think if after all my employees have the page on SharePoint. But we start with the first one, my page. Compliances. I don't stay here to enumerate all the possible compliances. I enumerate only the, the two beasts, the GDPR and the, the PDPA. Um, I want only spend a few words over these the two guys here. Uh, the GDPR in Europe, after one year, that the GDPR was uh, ratified by the European Commission. The, the Commission dedicated to the Czech find a lot of company that need to pay because they, their data, they store the data in not GDPR compliances. This means that after 12 months, there is people, the the total amount of the fee is like 2 billion of euros. Is, is a lot. So the total, total, not only one single company. This uh, is uh, something that let you, should be, start to you thinking about, hey, how I store my sensible data? Where is my password? <laughs> Where is my email? Where is my phone number, first name, last name, address, and so on? Okay. I started to see the condition and the reason that I showed you before during uh, the time. Okay, start with the uh, scalability and mobility. This is the this graph that I take from the CIB research that is was sponsored. This, uh, this uh, search, this uh, survey was sponsored by AWS itself in 2018, so one year ago. This uh, track, this line, a pretty exponential one, show you when born the Lambda and the starting of the serverless computation, when started the Azure and when started the Google cloud function. This is the trend from 2015 until last year, July of last year. This what's happened in June 2020. There is uh, the main serverless uh, container solution here, and you can see what is most used by the people. I left the detail to my colleague Nicola to speak about this guy. But I want only show you how much the company, the enterprises and the people start to develop according the re recent uh, 
cloud solution and architecture. The affordability. I take this uh, image by the public uh, EDG cloud survey of this year. So is, uh, maybe the situation can be changed. Okay, the question is, uh, what have been the biggest challenge or obstacle for your organization ability to take full av advantage of the public cloud resource, more or less, the overall? What they spend a lot is control the cloud cost. How, many, how much money I put on the cloud and why I put this money. Guys, easier, we are here. The beast is here. Data privacy and security challenge. I need to entrust the security, but the security should be not a, an obstacle for my people to work on my service. Otherwise, I destroy the service that I have. I reduce the uh, demand of the uh, functionality that I provide to my user. Securing uh, governments and compliances is 30%. So I spend a lot of to protect, but I need to spend also a lot of time uh, to be compliant. Managing the cloud resource is here. Is all this number, you, you, you can see, this is the big, the, the, the big trend is here, the last four. All this kind of stuff is uh, tiny separated because uh, all these uh, imply these two guys here. If I want to be secure and if I want a monitoring or a control over my cloud, uh, I have to take uh, some kind of operation. And more or less, this is the trend of this year. Maybe tomorrow change. Okay, this is uh, taken from um, the cloud security report by cybersecurity. What this uh, number means? This number means that I have that if I do that. Fast time to deploy. The security should be not an obstacle to deploy faster my code. A lot of time, okay, I use the password of admin because I need to do that. No. Or I need to access uh, in the database uh, as uh, admin. Uh, no. This means that something is uh, doesn't, the system has a bug but not the system in, in terms of software, the system in terms of procedure or process to guarantee your security. Cost saving, faster I deploy before I have uh, start my uh, return of the investment period. Less time I spend to deploy, less time I spend to develop, less time I not need to pay my people to do something and put them into a needed activity. My business need, uh, need a required activity. Reduce the effort around patch, uh, patches, uh, upgrade uh, of the software. The I like uh, to also to the cloud team to say that. Don't do that. Why? Because if you move uh, this kind of feature into the cloud, uh, and this is the phrase that I like, Google, Azure, OAWS works for you. Works uh, for you. Cioè, someone big work for you. They have uh, tons of people to think about that. So let them go. This is something that you can del rely to them. Delegate to them. The infrastructure is already tested. Your code maybe should be tested more time. They already done. When you can click some functionality, they did for you before. And we can trust according to their quality control. <laughs> okay, and this is, I don't enter uh, so much in the detail of this because here we speak about uh, the user, the visibility of the what the user are doing and what is the system, what the system are doing. 
how is the regulated the access the, uh, to the my application or the location that I have. As location here can is expressed as a data center location or the location as a region, physical region that you deploy your code, the, your application, I'm sorry. Your data, your workload into the, into the cloud. This is, uh, is the matter of this discussion and uh, meet uh, the cloud compliance uh, expectation. This is uh, when I say, is referred to when I say right, is right for you. Don't start to use this service and this service don't fit your context. Because otherwise you need to spend more time. You need to create workaround, patches and so on. At, at the end, you don't receive all the benefits of the, uh, this specific cloud service. Okay, now customer case number one. Sorry for um, anonymizer and confidential, I, tr I put some kind of uh, naming, uh, fancy name from paper to the cloud. The, this customer A, O Alice, have uh, their business focus uh, on tons of paper. When we went to the customer side for the first time, we go in their office and I see a lot of uh, um, scaffolding, let me say scaffolding, for store the paper. B huge folder full of paper that have a meaning for them. And the office is, the wall of the office is fully covered. My, question, my first question is, if I need to go in the bathroom, where is the bathroom? <laughs> where is the indication <laughs> to go to the bathroom? They cannot put that because of all the wall or the slogan of the company or something like that, the motivational phrase. They don't have space because they are storing all these kind of paper. And I, I, I think that in the cellar there is other archive of this uh, paper. So our goal was digitalize uh, the paper works. We automate the data generation because this data, this, this paper, should be converted uh, into a digital format and from this digital format extract the data. We, uh, by our partner, we add also the machine learning over this data. Because we say, sorry guys, at the end you have this uh, public, you have this uh, report, uh, forecast or whatever. Can we apply some machine learning system to, to help you at least uh, to make a sense in this data? They say, okay. The on paper or on digital format, when someone produce this digital format, they share the same file from the top level until the bottom. So all the people potentially can store the data of the, uh, of the company. And honestly, I don't know. <laughs> Integration with the post process. The, the all the paperwork uh, is at the beginning uh, of uh, the process and procedure for sale, marketing, uh, uh, development, and business uh, um, activities. So we integrate uh, the solution that exit uh, from uh, the, di the, the data that uh, stay on the paper, in, uh, integrate uh, the solution with the, with the step after of uh, the paper. Okay, at the end of the story, two years, boost uh, for all the procedure. Okay, the step number one is done. What is our boost? A lot. Sorry, I cannot see the number. So, okay, it's something good. Thank you very much. <laughs> Security enhancement. The admin can see all, the bottom people can see only their part, because they, this is their visibility. All the managers are happy, because they can see, they don't no need to think about how my employer can treat this data, how they can stall or whatever. Okay, this is the data that they can see, this is the data that you can see, 
stop, done, it's good in that way. Less effort for the entire process. It's all digital, there is all the automation that also Greg, my, uh, my colleague uh, next to me, will explain to you. And uh, of course, they have more time for them. Productivity extension, what's happened? Okay, we release the, the, fir the, be the, the first phase, uh, we enter in the second, and uh, during one of the meeting to speak about the second phase, uh, um, on in the uh, during the break, uh, we say there is uh, someone that uh, asks us, uh, Seven Peaks, do you know that we are now, we are going to play with our data? I say, hey guys, <laughs> play with your data. What, <laughs> what do you mean? They, their process was full optimized that they remove all the issues that before they have, and now they have time to think and play with their data about something other else. How boost, for example, how optimize uh, some number that belongs to another department. Is, uh, say, we play with, uh, with our data, huh? Sorry? Gilo? <laughs> okay, and this is for us was uh, one of the uh, huge victory because this is one of the first and huge feedback that we make good and better our work. So we did a good job. Okay, the customer case number two, from server to PAS, uh, platform as a service. Once upon time, there is a data center, and uh, they move this uh, data center by a technique that is called lift and ship. Physi not physically the hardware or the server, uh, lift Sorry, there is the rack. Plug off and bring it in the cloud. It is a process of uh, moving the uh, virtualized the server and push it into the cloud for not legacy and legacy solution. So this is the situation that we find. We say, okay, some according our scope of work, there are the uh, some solution that uh, can be moved in the uh, platform as a service. First of all, they want some application, and uh, second at all, they want some integration with this application. Why? Because uh, for before, the application was uh, into the data center. So if one application uh, need to speak, if Alice need to speak with Bob, need to travel or transit by Charlie Dalton uh, and uh, other people to be secure and manage that. Unfortunately, Mr. X and Mrs. Y is not the only one that should be managed all the network traffic, the storage, the server allocation, the energy, AC, and so on. So for them, before was pretty impossible or spend a lot of time to let speak Alice with Bob. The data storage, they have uh, a lot of that. They store a lot of data. And uh, moving uh, to the uh, platform as a service, the, the database uh, scale automatically and they store can store more data than before. This is the goal, the scalability before this application run on the server. When this application starts to be critical, what they are doing? Take another server, upgrade the RAM, disk, CPU, and so on, and uh, restart the application and hope that this new server works. Security. Mickey Mouse can enter here. Okay, you may, may, may put in this way. They have a huge, or they did, a huge mind and approach shift. They don't think more about the infrastructure routing storage. They think about the service. I want my page in SharePoint. My employee should have their page in SharePoint, 
For them, this means how many server I need to co I need to build the cluster of the SharePoint, how many data, how many hard disk, how many storage I need to allocate, how many loon on the data on the disk array I need to allocate and so on. They no don't think anymore about that. Now they think about how much is the responsive uh, of SharePoint and if SharePoint now is the right server, s r uh, right solution, I'm sorry. Simplification of the effort. Before there is Miss, uh, Mr. X, uh, Mrs. Y, and maybe Miss uh, Zita. Now the, the team are responsible for their application and for the integration of their application. So if uh, Alice need to speak with Bob, the, the manager of Alice go directly to the manager of Bob. Uh, sorry, you need to expose to endpoint. No, I don't want it. But they can speak in that way. Management improvement. No need to speak with three million of people. It's only two, two managers that speak together. And maybe their team leader and four people done. The solution is applied. After we discover, we propose them to move uh, their legal legacy application as a software as a service, SAP, uh, Oracle, uh, products, and so on. If you have some question, okay, feel free. Otherwise, I'm done here. This is our, I hope that I try to express uh, our experience to you, what is uh, the main goal for the migration of the cloud, and I hope that you are able to uh, formulate your solution with uh, this uh, short guideline. Uh, so, okay, this is our CEO, our CTO, and this is the end of my uh, presentation. Who is the next, Nicola or Greg? Greg? Greg, where is Greg? Okay. Uh, okay, okay, guys. Um, I give uh, to Greg the time to <laughs> to have uh, this technical operation. Um, when you think to move in the cloud, it seems easy, but I s we suggest all the time think about the solution. Focus on the solution that you want, not how do is why first. Indeed, indeed, this is my first point of my slide. Why should I move in the cloud? Second, how? I don't give you the technicality, I give you a sort of guideline to follow, and I hope uh, that you can have some benefit uh, for, uh, for your case. Okay, thank you very much, Greg, to be here. He is the next uh, speaker. Hello. Welcome. Um, okay, let's get started. So I am here to discuss a little bit more about uh, automation in business. Quick intro, I am Craig, as you see here. Um, I've been in Seven Peaks for a while, looking at UX, UI, moving into business, and looking more into how we manage projects. And uh, yeah, we've done a lot in the last maybe year we were looking at how we automate. But we're looking at business uh, process automation, which is digital transformation. Today, it's process automation, not the same thing. Definition is the ability to orchestrate and integrate tools. However, it's a bit more than that. It's looking at how we mitigate risk, how we make things easier, work as a team, how we look at our flows and processes internally when we build projects, how we operate between client and ourselves. One of the examples is a hiring process that always starts with staff. We can look at staff requirements, we can fulfill project requirements from staffing levels, hopefully we'll have success. Project management, again, something we're touching on a lot here, is how do we look at uh, the overview of projects? How do we look at 
you know, what kind of staff we need, when we need them, the workloads, the delegation, and then how do we end up planning so we can end up with <laughs> success, hopefully, um, and how do we drag that out over not just the first sprint, we're looking at second sprint, third sprint, and again, a project is not just one time, it's multiple time frame. Now, we also need to remember that we have QA. QA is something most people forget. We just assume it's tests. But when we look at process automation, we have to make sure that when we develop, we also include things like regression testing. How do we make it easy for a business to not just build, but how do we then test that, reiterate, make progress, and then continue so that we can push a product that makes sense? No bugs, higher success. Now, I went through that quick, quick, so we can look at an example from Seven Peaks without naming names. <laughs> Nobody will be here, so it's okay. Okay, so we're gonna call it Project X. This is not the movie, so we don't need to worry about getting drunk or anything. But uh, in this example, this is a project we've had for a while. It's uh, B2B, uh, eventually spanned into B2C. E-commerce back office, so we have multiple portals. We have third-party pages that can be accessed with different tokens and keys, and it's primarily desktop. So we had a one focus. We didn't need to worry about mobile responsiveness. We didn't need to worry about any of uh, the angle. So this is a long-running project, about two years. It started out as mainly e-commerce. We wanted a simple website for this client where their customers can log into the system. Purchase products, check out. Really, really, really simple. However, this is a project that also grows and expands. So over the last couple of years, we've migrated this to uh, encompass new business requirements. This has taken a toll on us as a business because we have to look at how do we manage this? How do we work with teams over a long period of time? And how do we integrate a process that saves you know, energy, it saves us focus, so we can pick the right angle, the right features, and progress forward. So one of the things that, <laughs> in the last two weeks, <laughs> we've had to monitor usage. This is something that people often forget. We have to look at usage. When we build, it's not just the building process, we have to try and figure out a way so we can rely on a system to monitor what we're doing, right? So if we build a software release it, we have to also know when something doesn't work. Quite often we rely on someone going checking or a client reporting a bug, uh, even customers sending in lots of emails complaining, ah, I can't check out. If we have monitoring usage, we can actually look at what happens and when. We can look at how we notify people, in particular the team, so project leads, management, if we want to look at specific people in the team. We have to connect the dots to make this happen so we can, in this case, we can look at error logs and server instant status. So if something goes down, we need to know before the client does so we can understand what happens. We can dig deeper in, get the information so we can provide a solution before it becomes a bigger issue. Hopefully, this will never happen, but it most likely will, in particular, when you're scaling a product. If you have a point in the product development cycle where you will go two, three months without actual development, then most likely you will have time to look at something like this. Performance indicators. Most underrated tool for development process. A lot of people assume these KPIs are for sales, they're for business management. In our case, we can start developing towards a KPI of our own. So this might be processes that happen on a regular basis we know are dependent on other things. In this example, we're looking at things like orders. We know this platform, you know, we can almost, within a reasonable doubt, pick certain processes like ordering, checkout process, reordering, if the customer will definitely edit an order, then we can look at KPI. How many times are they doing this? How do we identify it? 
how do we then track that usage? If, for example, we have 200 users in one hour, the order, we want to know why and what happens next. If we don't understand what happens next, we could lose a server. Something goes down, we don't understand it. So KPI is a good way to track, and we can also attach that to automation. We might be able to send an alert to the client or to developers, even to QA, just to alert them that this action has happened. We need to make sure nothing goes down. On the opposite side, we can also look at why there are no orders. If there's a trend in development where all of a sudden there's no server activity, that's something to worry about. So we can track this, automate it. We can make it easier for QA to jump in, test, make sure there's no actual issues on the platform. So this is something people never really look at, but it's something that you can track internally. So normally, you don't want to put pros and cons. You just want pros. It's nice to see the good stuff. But there's always pros and cons in everything. So as a business, you want to see you know, things like you can catch performance issues. Right? So when you develop a product, you push it out there, you track. If you use AWS in this example, you want to catch performance issues before it becomes an issue. You want to see things that are latent. You want to see error codes popping up. These error codes might be a one-time thing. However, if you have tracking, if you look at the automation process, you flag this. We use uh, Slack on our uh, development process, so we can actually have this come into our Slack channel, notify the entire team that maybe there's something going on here. So it's good uh, to actually do this process. The ability to optimize quickly. This is something a lot of teams don't do. They don't optimize. They don't come back and see areas of improvement. When we say ability to optimize quickly, we want to look at statistically this process happens a lot. If we have a way of tracking this and telling you as a team or possibly the, even the project manager, this issue occurs quite a lot. We need to simplify the process. We need to notify you before it becomes a, a larger issue or before a lot more people start using this process. We can use the KPIs from before and we can use insights as well from AWS to actually look at these areas of contention areas where people slow down. Uh, reduce costs. Everybody likes this one. Save money. If we are able to notify you that there's a problem, you can go in, fix it, release, no issue. You are saving the customer from having an issue. You are saving the client from having loss of business. We are also able to catch it, which means that we can put that in the business process, the development process, before we need to stop, plan it, and push it forward. An example would be if a server is constantly trying to scale, that's a cost, right? AWS will charge you, we go through the roof if we don't know that this is scaled. So if we're able to catch that first, we can adjust the problem, push a hot fix, and we've just saved ourselves some money. The client saves themselves issue and the customer never knows it's happened. Now, this load handling and scaling automation is something we've, myself and Giorgio, have recently dived into. Um, as some of you might know, load handling is uh, quite an interesting topic. It's a separate workshop. But this basically allows you to direct traffic and balance out the website. If you have multiple entries into this website, this will save you a lot of money. You might not need to scale. You might need to scale and you know, one way or another. If we set up a business process where we can track what's going on, if we can track issues, if we can understand what's really happening by you looking at the insight setting KPIs, creating thresholds using multiple tools, there's endless tools, then we can actually catch these things and save money, start handling the traffic as we need. And again, this all results in a successful business but it also results in a successful development cycle as well. Less time to develop, less issues, less bugs. The cons of it, though, is uh, time and cost to set up. So it's something you have to consider that it will take time. Costs, that depends on exactly what you're doing. 
time and cost to train. So that would be looking at staff. How do we get the staff that we have in our development? And how do we make sure we utilize them properly? So you have to look at the team talent, or you also have to look at how we utilize the software and platform within the team as well. And then it requires constant monitoring. I put this in the cons column, but it's actually probably a pros as well because you're constantly looking at other ways you can redevelop this process, right? So if we have a website where you've got 10,000 people come in in the first week to place orders, and it might be a three-month cycle for that product to reach the customer, we can look at what's going on before and after and use the part in between to develop and push. So we're looking at the, the system on a regular basis where we know in the next cycle maybe we can improve something, make it even faster for them and reliable. But how do we do it? Nobody explains how we do this process. Now, I read a book the other day. Roy gave it to me. And it's kind of changed my thinking a little teeny bit about how we actually do these things. So the first thing I took from the book was the fact that you have to research. But not just research, you've got to re-research. There's a lot of automation you can do where we think that we've tagged this thing, right? We understand what the problem is in the, the system, but we don't understand how to connect the dots, right? So you have the tracking the system. You understand that this is a problem, but how do you look back at this process and then engage with that? So in this example, we have to understand how it works. So that's understanding the platform, understanding how we actually engage with it, and then how do we integrate that into their daily lives. For us, we're looking at things like Slack, simple. If something goes wrong, pops up in Slack, easy. The second thing you can look at, how do you integrate that into a warning system first? So not just pop it up in Slack, but send it out to other people in the team, if there's a performance issue on a server where multiple websites have been affected, how do we then distribute that to management? So research is essential. You've got to look at your process and look at it again and understand where you can improve it. Workshops, retrospectives. So we have uh, retrospectives, like everyone else, discoveries, specific automation workshops. We need to understand from the development team specifically what they can do to implement some sort of flow, some sort of process. And again, we have, I think, one of the endpoints uh, that we custom built for a client in Project X, where we're looking at stock levels. We created an endpoint, we put it into a spreadsheet, Google Sheets, and all this does is notify the client when stock gets to a certain point. We can use this to quickly notify them as a step one process in order to you know, have them take action over their stock until we get to a point where it's automated for them. We discovered this through workshops. After talking to them, we had three, four workshops about stock and what they actually need as an output. So workshops, they're underused. They are extremely valuable. We have to also measure the output versus the effort. In some scenarios, you will Assume that it's great to measure something. You have this tool, you have the means to do it, you have the budget, but then it doesn't actually make sense to track it because it might not be the actual thing you need to track to get the output you want. We assume if a server goes down, you want to get notified via an email, or if even the server is the thing you want to track. You might want to track an event instead. It might be an order creation process. And in our example, we've had multiple um, scenarios where we've tracked different events because we know that connects to other things in the system. So you don't need to track everything, but you have to measure if it's the thing you want versus the effort to actually implement it. Is it really worthwhile? And data. Yes, we can track data internally for us. We can track data that we use we can track data that is generated by usage of the website and how we connect it to our systems. So if you look at this one at the end here, how much time was used to perform an action multiple times? This is a good example of being able to 
look at something using normal analytical tracking, turn it into a flow so that we can track that's happened and if it's going to be a problem. An ordering process is a good example, and a cancellation process is also a great example for us. We can trigger this update to know if there's a high flux of traffic or if it dips the opposite way around. There might be a server issue, there might be you know, four or five codes, there might be something else going down that we have no idea about until we're notified by the system. And time. Everybody needs time. So things don't always happen when we need them. We have to plan, we have to organize, and we have to take our time to understand everything from above, but we also have to understand how long it takes to do these automations. The whole concept of being able to track a process, to be able to connect from one system to the other, it takes time to make it work. It takes time to also understand how the output can change the team. One of the things we don't understand on a daily basis is why things happen. Right? We understand it's gone down. We understand the error code. We understand that we can get it back up and running. But taking time to analyze on a regular basis to also plan it the right way will give us more information and the output we need to make sure the flow and the automation process gives us what we need to make sure it never happens again. So there's plenty of tools, but some of the tools that we've used to integrate is Power BI. So this is a system, everybody assumes it's just for customers. It's used for ourselves as well. So we can use Power BI to create a report to track usage internally to understand if there's a lot of load being put on one endpoint versus a second endpoint. If, for example, staff are busy creating orders but they're never actually busy editing orders, we can look at how we distribute that load, right? Power BI also allows us to create automatic reporting systems. So we can generate reports when something happens that shouldn't happen, and then we can add that into the customer's flow themselves so that they understand what's happening and then we get a report so we understand when we need to fix something. Google 360, it's a nice one. Again, we can utilize it internally too. Google 360 allows us to quickly track an event. We can use it to track events, flows, and segments when we know that there's a problem. We can track it, we can output that into anything we want. It gives it uh, gives us the advantage of making it into an alert or into something like Slack. Google 360 is a, a new tool for us. So we will be trying our hardest, hopefully, to uh, do a couple of workshops on how we internally at Seven Peaks can utilize this for process automation. So we need to understand on some of our projects how we utilize this more. But essentially, it's the same as uh, Power BI, where we can create segments, identify them, understand what we do, and output. And Jira, development at its finest here. I, <laughs> I don't like Jira, but I use it, and it's fun to uh, automate with. Jira has automation flows. They have automation processes where we can track when a report comes back from Bitbucket. When we push something to, say, the testing platforms using Rails, or if we want to push to GitHub, the Gits, or anything else we're using. That sounds like it's a very development process. However, as a PM, this makes perfect sense. If someone pushes something to the server and it crashes, we need to understand what it was that we were doing we need to understand the code that was used, and we need to understand how we fix this as quick as possible. In a couple of scenarios this week, we've pushed a few things, and uh, we knew instantly because we have a tracking. We integrate with Jira, we integrate with Bitbucket, we integrate with Jenkins, and we also have an output on AWS where we can go in, we can look at insights, we can pull the code, and we know exactly where that happened and when. This allows us to quickly develop. This allows us to review exactly what it was that went wrong. In most cases, our QA now are also integrated into this process where they can actually pull out instances and we can go in, 
we can rewind that process and see, okay, there's four different things that happened here and two different systems that happened too, and track that back and fix it. This is essential for making sure we debug our process, our system, and the product. We can then move things backwards, fix it, and we can make sure, hopefully, it never happens again. Hopefully. I buy this one in here. This is nice for PMs. Money.com. Justin? <laughs> We've been trying to uh, test Money.com uh, internally and the small team just to see exactly how we can automate the PM process. Now, uh, money.com is used only for PM process, for delegation of tasks, and for understanding workload in general. That plays a big part in how we automate the entire development cycle and how we build the, pro the product for the customer. If I plan a sprint and it makes no sense, the developers can review it. They can leave comments, they can then move things and add tickets that make sense to them. And we can automate that into JIRA and assign that to a developer or to QA. And then we can also get the output back when they push. It's just a nice way to, for us to keep track on if there's something wrong, if there's something that we need to update, especially if we're pushing and something breaks. And a very long list of tools. There is an endless amount of tools. And this is why I always tell people we have to research exactly how we automate anything we do in the system. Process automation is all about reviewing what we do. It's all about making sure that we can cut down on the amount of effort it takes to actually do something and make sure it's more accurate. So I've typed this up, but essentially, um, the longer you have a project, the longer you build on one system, the more essential automating something becomes. And again, we're not talking about robots. We're not talking about you know, business integrations here. We're talking purely about looking at things that happen. And if we can say to someone, we don't need you to do that every single day, we can get the system to do that and make sure you can be utilized in some other way. It's a win for the business. It's a win for us. It's a win for the end user, which is the customer. It means that we can be more accurate. It means we can be on point and spend our time actually developing the product. It's difficult. We need to understand what it is, and we also need to document what it is. So while people, I think that we've had a couple of clients before where we've said to them about we, we can do this process. We can automate our entire QA process. We can automate integration. We can automate anything else. And they always say, like, what's the cost? And, why is it so difficult to do it? Why is it going to take you three weeks? And the answer is basically, it's going to take time. We need to review process. We need to make sure when we do it, it's done right. But it's worth the effort. Because eventually, if you're on a long project, this will save you time, money. It'll make sure that the product is as good as it can be. It mitigates and reduces risk. And I think this is a selling point everyone should take note of. If you can build a product, where the accuracy of the build, the accuracy of the product, and selling that to not only your users, but also to other businesses, your business partners, your CTO, your CEO. If you can tell them, this product now, we're developing it, it's 8% accurate development process. What does that mean? That basically means when we develop something, we have a high confidence in the product. We have the high confidence in the code. The software now becomes a low-risk product. We can develop a lot longer, we can develop a lot faster, and we can also make sure that the product never actually crashes. And it makes your team happy. Everybody's happy when we do this. When you tell your boss, ah, we saved $200 this month just because we changed this one process and we never have to do it, it tells us that there's something wrong here. Then we're going to save some money. Hopefully it'll be $2,000, but... Yep. But the whole idea of automating a process just comes down to common sense and making sure that you understand the product you're building and you make sure you build a way to catch the problems before it becomes a problem. And that is me. But I think we should have a, a second session at some point in the future.
where we dig deeper into the actual process itself. Bonjour. So this is a continuity of the talk after the cloud uh, migration. So serverless and container. So this talk is not about uh, migrating all your VMs into containers and serverless. It's just if the requirements needs to lead to container and serverless, you will have the tools and the metrics to see if you need to do it. Because in some way, VM is the solution. <laughs> so I'm Nicolas Pierson, so solution architect working at Seven Peaks. So I like hiking. So if some people want to discuss about hiking, going in the mountains, and uh, sleeping. <laughs> Let's talk about it's me. So first, what is containerization and what is serverless? So on the left side, you see YAS, CAS, PASS, and FAST. So it's always four letters. So on the left side, it's infrastructure as code, container as, co uh, container as a service, platform as a service, is function as a service. So when we are talking about VM, it's on the infrastructure as a service on the, on the left. So what you manage, what you're managing on the infrastructure as a service is the virtualization and the hardware. So everything that is above the OS, container, runtime, application function is on you. So basically you are managing a lot of things. Maybe you need it, maybe you don't need it. So when you probably, you say, okay, maybe I don't want to manage the OS, I don't want to manage my Linux server, I don't want to manage my Windows server, what I just want is a node environment. So maybe let's put my application in a container and then I will just manage my runtime application and the code. In the middle, we have a platform as a service, which can on AWS is um, Elastic Beanstalk. So they will provision for you a VM, set up node, you will still have access to the OS, but um, yeah, a solution in between. And the last one is a function as a service. So this one, you don't manage anything except your code. So you just say, I want Node, Java, or C Sharp. You put your code, and they take care of everything for you. Your runtime container OS virtualization and hardware. And um, you can see also that the security will be impacted. So when you are managing your OS, you need to patch your Linux server yourself. And you need to deploy it and see if it's working, doing the QA and everything. On a function, you just need to manage the security on your code, which is like a small piece of code. So you spend less time doing the some jobs that maybe you don't need to do. So if you bring this to the cloud, so you can do YAS, PASS, SAS, and function on your on-premise um, data center. But what is really interesting is to put this in the cloud, to be cloud native. So AWS Azure, Alibaba, or Google Cloud, they provide some common tools for all the services, which are modularity, operability, elasticity, and resiliency. So they have a big data center, so they can provide this for you by default. You don't need to do it. So the more you go on the function side, basically, they will take care of more things for you. So when you put your code, they will be able to spin up 1,000 functions for you. And you don't have to do auto scale, or you don't have to take care of these things, because when a call will hit the function, they will, spin, they will spin up a new container with a function inside. And you don't have to say, oh, if my CPU reach 80%, I need to scale. In a container, you need to do this. In a container, you need to say, oh, 
if there is something that each a threshold, for example, I have too many read writes or I have too many CPU consumption, I need to auto scale. So the more you go on the function part, the less you have to manage, but you lose in the configuration. So the big question is, if you move from VM to container or, or to serverless, can you deliver faster to your production environment? Can you bring more value to your customer or can you bring more value for your product? So if you split, for example, your VM into small services, into small containers, you will be able to just make small modification in a part of your system and you will have more agility to deploy this bug fix and uh, it will be also easier for the developer to update this. You also remove everything that is server-side configuration, deployment, and provisioning, because it's taken care by the service uh, cloud provider. And then all the services that is provided by default will come to you. So then serverless or container? It's always a, a, a big question, because one is like a really tiny bit of code. The function is really a small piece of code, but you will have a lot of to manage. If you put in a container, you can you can put a bigger bunch of code. So serverless is really like, if you want to deploy something really quick, you just want to, for example, get something from the database. You just put your function, in the attribute, you just say what you want in, and you just query the database and you return. Actually, it takes 15 minutes if you know how to do it. And you can have an, a rest endpoint. But the downside of this is like serverless, you, they just provide you a limit set of run times. So you, for example, if you want now on AWS, we have a JavaScript, uh, C Sharp, I forgot, uh, Python, and Java. Yeah. And uh, if you want to run Ruby on Rails or Ruby code, it cannot. Or you need to use some adapter. So you are kind of limited on the language that you want to use, but it provides some value. And the last point is more some skills, actually, that it's. When you set up a serverless function, the way how you structure your application will be different as a monolithic. Because an, um, as a mon monolithic, we know how to do it for 20 years, which just set up a big bunch of code, controller, services, and entity layer. But in a function, what you want to is to put a, just a simple piece of code that will run the fastest as possible. On the container side, what it will help, it will remove the management of the operating system. But you will still need to install on your Docker image your node and to patch it. But you will have less to manage. And need more configuration. The second point is how is it, to how is it is easy to scale? So now that you are in a cloud, the point is you want to be able to reach like one user or 1,000 user or 1 million user. So as the code is a little bit less than the VM on serverless and container, you have more agility to scale and scale up and scale down. For example, before you put all your code in one VM, but maybe some users are using one function one one API one API endpoint in your VM, but you need to scale your entire VM to to serve all your users. So here, what you can do is just say, "Oh, I separated my only f the function that is only used by everybody, so I can just scale the little bit function, and the rest will stay the same." And it's easy to manage and provision because take care by AWS. But you will have a downside, which is a cold start. So each time a function is called, maybe we reuse a previous function instance, or maybe we'll try to spin up a new one and it needs to spin up the uh, runtime with it. On the other side, the container. So on the container, you don't have any call start, so it's ready to use, you can call. But you need to configure the scaling part manually and to say which are the metrics that you want to use to scale. 
so more configuration on the container side. But the response time is faster than the function. The last one is the cost. So what we are trying to save here is if we can scale more easily and just scale the piece of code that we need to serve our user, normally we will only scale up what is used on our platform. So if nobody is using our platform, we will not scale up and we'll just put everything to the minimum as possible. Or we'll just scale up the little bit of function that needs to be. And the security is improved by default by the container or by the function. So this one is a functionality provided by Azure AWS or the cloud service provider. So the billing model on the serverless, what is really interesting also is you pay as you go. So like Joe just said, so if you have an application, you have three calls during the day because it's a back office application. You don't want to pay a VM, you don't want to pay $50 a month for a VM that someone used just one, uh, maybe five minutes a day. So what you can do is to set up a serverless function. One is call, you pay, and uh, that's it, simple. And you need, and this way, this will also help you to focus on your functionality and not about setting the infrastructure, the VM, the networking, and everything. You just push your code. On the other side, for the container, you can, like Georgia said, you can just, they will just spin up one VM for you, but you will not see it, and they will put as many Docker images, Docker instance on this, ima on this VM. So they will try to reuse and to maximize the usage of the VM. And the downside is like you will still not need to configure this. So just to give you some <laughs> metrics, so maybe it, it will help you to consider or not function. So half of global enterprise will have deployed function uh, by 2025. So um, some big companies are seeing the value in using the function because it's light and maybe for some workloads makes sense because you just implement an endpoint but it's used one per day. So so what, I don't have to pay any VM, so it's, it's really good to use. And on the other side, because we have some clients that are using function for that serve millions of requests per second. And this also could be really interesting because they don't want to manage the infrastructure or they want to don't want to manage the scaling. So function answer to this, because function, you don't need to say which parameter you want to use for auto scaling. So for each request, they will spin up a new function. It will scale automatically for you. For the container, it's the same, but here, actually, here is more prominent. So the default choice for 75% of new customer enterprise application by 2024. So I think by default, most of the customer will go for container first because they don't want to manage anymore the VM. They want to still have customer on time, but they want to offload some work. So that's why 75% 2024. And uh, seventy-five percent of large enterprise in military economy. So, the question is, in which case you prefer to use container, and in which case you prefer to use serverless? So, like, so this one is, I want to be able to serve a customer with a API response, uh, with a API, uh, with an API. But I know that this API will be used maybe 10 times a day. And I have a limit, really limited budget for my application. <laughs> so what can I do? It's just to set up on AWS an API gateway and to set up a Lambda. So I just put my code and it's called one or twice a day. If you do this, uh, if you remember on the serverless side, we have a call start. So each time you spin up a new function, it will take a little bit of time. But the client client said, 
I don't want to pay. I can I can wait three seconds for each call. So why not? <laughs> so maybe in this case, if the if, the, if your customer is agrees on, okay, I want to spend less less cost on the platform, and I'm willing to wait three seconds, maybe makes sense. And after, there is some mechanism that you can do is to put maybe your request into a queue and do your background jump later. So you will not have to wait too long. The second one is for lift and shift. So for containers, so what is really good about containers is like you bring your runtime with you. You bring everything that is related to the application with your container. So they choose in this solution to have like a responsive API. So this is a CDN, so content delivery network, and this is a load balancer. And here you have the, the compute part with the containers. So on AWS, there is a service called Fargate. So Fargate is a serverless um, service. So you don't say how many VM you want. You just say, I want 500 megabytes of RAM and one vCPU. And they will provide this you. They, they will provide this for you. And they will scale automatically. So this allows the user of this application to have a fast response time, because no call start. And uh, it's easy to lift and shift, because you just put your container somewhere else. The last one, I don't know if. Uh, <laughs> so the last one is on Azure. So serverless is also good for background tasks. So we have the call start. But if we have something to do in the back, we can say, OK, I wait three seconds. I don't care, because it's a background task, and I need I will process it later. So for this application, we have the same concept as uh, before. So you have a API gateway where your endpoints are exposed. You have some functions so to expose the uh, API endpoints. And they store some information in the database. And then you can see here, there is uh, something called third parties. So apparently, we are trying to inject some data to the database. And this process is done like every day at 5 AM. And here, that you can see, Data Factory is a service that ingests a lot of data. But when you have a small amount of, yeah, this one normally ingests a lot of data. So what they do is they put a cluster of Spark and or whatever, Hive some big data tools to ingest your data. But sometimes we just have a small amount of data to import in the DB. So what we use is a Lambda function, is a Azure function to import the data. And this process can take five minutes to load the data. And you don't care about the call start, and the import is running every day at 5 AM. So you don't need to pay a VM 24 seven for a job that is just once a day. So that's it. <laughs> Question or dinner or both? Pizza. I, c I can see the pizza. Yeah, we're going to have a short break. Pizza is ready, so grab a piece and get another drink. สวัสดีครับก็มาถึงเซสชันสุดท้ายของเรานะครับวันนี้ก็เกี่ยวข้องกับเซกิวริตี้ของ Alibaba Cloud นะครับเราจะมีเสื้อเชิ้ตแจกด้วยนะครับ we have like five t-shirts for people who can like answer the query question from Alibaba Cloud also before you get back home like get food from pizza and beer <laughs> get drunk <laughs>
Would you like me to run in English, or Thai? Okay. อาลีบาบาคลาวของเราก็มาในประเทศไทยในปีที่แล้วในปี2018นะครับแล้วก็ตอนนี้เรามีทีมงานที่ที่เป็นผมเป็นนักสันหลีหาดครับผมเป็น Head of Solution Architect ประจำประเทศไทยส่วนอีก2ท่านที่มาด้วยจะเป็น Country Manager แล้วก็ Marketing Manager นะครับแล้วก็สำหรับ Topic ในวันนี้ก็จะพอพูดในเรื่องของ Cyber Security on Cloud นะครับคือเกี่ยวข้องกับด้าน Security อาลีบาบาคลาวเป็น world leading cloud provider เป็นอันดับหนึ่งในประเทศจีนอันดับหนึ่งในเอเชียแปซิฟิกและก็อันดับ3ของโลกนะครับเป็นอันดับ3รองจาก Microsoft Azure และก็ AWS นะครับอันนี้คือ market share ในเอเชียแปซิฟิกเราเป็นอันดับหนึ่งนะครับก็คือในจีนทั้งหมด10กว่า region นอกจีนแล้วก็มีประมาณ10กว่า region เหมือนกันรวมแล้วก็20กว่า region นอกจีนในทางด้านเอเชียแปซิฟิกเรามีอินโดนีเซียมีมาเลเซียมีกำลังจะมีที่ฟิลิปปินส์แล้วก็มาเลเซียนี่เรามี Scrubbing Center ที่คอย mitigate bad traffic ของ anti DDoS service อยู่ด้วยนะครับแล้วก็เป็นเป็น best partner consulting digital ใน China ก็คือเราจะมี economic of scale ของ partner ที่ทำ consulting ไม่ว่าจะเป็น product และ service ในการที่จะ implementation ที่จะ deliver product ของ Alibaba c l o u ให้กับ customer แล้วก็มีอีโคซิสเต็มของอาลีบาบาคลาวค่อนข้างเยอะอย่างเช่นใช้เนี่ยวลอจิสติกแล้วก็อาลีเพทีมอลถาวเปาครับซึ่งแพลตฟอร์มต่างๆเหล่านี้เนี่ยเราก็ใช้ในอินฟราสตรักเจอร์ของเราทั้งหมดคลาวด์เซกิวริตี้โปรดักของเราทั้งหมดแล้วก็ดับเบิลอีเลฟเว่นที่เป็นเวิลด์ลัชเจสเทสเอเวอร์ก็ใช้แพลตฟอร์มของอาลีบาบาคลาวครับใช้พวกคูเบอร์เนติสแพลตฟอร์มแล้วก็ Security on Cloud สำหรับ security compliance เราก็มีค่อนข้างเยอะจากที่เห็นในสไลด์ก็จะเป็นลักษณะของ ISO 27001 ISO 20000 ISO 21001แล้วก็พวก SOC 1 SOC 2 SOC 3ที่เกี่ยวข้องกับ security แล้วก็ PTI TD PCI DSS ที่เกี่ยวข้องกับการตัดบัตรเครดิตนะครับแล้วก็อันนี้ก็เป็นส่วนหนึ่งของลูกค้าของ Alibaba Cloud นะครับจะเห็นได้ว่าเป็น500 100 fortune นะครับบริษัท Product นี้จะขอพูดคร่าวๆก็ในส่วนของที่เป็น infrastructure as a service อันนี้เราก็ไม่ต่างจากเจ้าอื่นแต่ว่าเราจะมีจุดเด่นที่ต่างจากเจ้าอื่นเราคือราคาเราค่อนข้างค่อนข้างดาวลงมาได้เพราะว่า infrastructure เรา economic of scale เรามี49 AC ทั่ว Asia Pacific มี region มากที่สุดในเอเชีย Computing เราก็มีคล้ายๆอย่างเช่น ECS Elastic Compute Service ตัวนี้มันก็คล้ายๆกับ EC2 Elastic Compute Cloud ของ AWS แล้วก็ Google uh, Google Server แล้วก็มี Bare Metal มี Auto Scaling มี Container Service Networking เราก็จะมีพวก VPC Express Connect Net Gateway Global Accelerator Storage ก็จะเป็น Block Storage Object Based Storage มี NAS มี Cloud Storage Gateway ตรงนี้คิดว่า 3-4 เจ้าที่เป็น Cloud Provider หลัก Azure Microsoft ที่เป็น GCP เป็น AWS เนี่ยไม่ได้ต่างกันมากแต่เราจะมีจุดเด่นทางด้าน Database Big Data e t r i b a s e แล้วก็มี Private Cloud นอกจากนี้มี Security Product อย่างเช่น Anti DUS Service Security มี WAF Web Application Firewall แล้วก็ Network Anti DDoS แล้วก็ a p p s t r a Stack เราก็มีสำหรับ Private Cloud นอกจากนี้ก็มี Industry Solution ด้วยนะครับสำหรับ security layer ที่ใช้ protection cloud แล้วก็มี security หลายๆ layer ไม่ว่าจะเป็น VM security data security network security application security แล้วก็จะมี RAM user authentication hardware security account security ครบทุก layer นะครับอย่างเช่น security intelligence automated service แล้วก็มี scrubbing center ที่มาเลเซียที่ใกล้สุดจะมี product ของ WAF ที่คอย protection ไม่ว่าจะเป็น cross site script หรือจะเป็น SQL injection หรือ HTTP f a t จะมีการระบบ intelligence system ในการเรียนรู้ bad traffic ที่เข้ามาแล้วก็ mitigate ไปยัง scrubbing center แล้วก็จะมี IP warehouse จะมี high concurrency แล้วก็ enhanced algorithm นะครับ feature ของ WAP แล้วก็มี zero days vulnerability protection มี threat intelligence แล้วก็มี like anti lead protection สามารถ customize security protection ได้สำหรับทุกเว็บแอปพลิเคชันไฟวอล
ซึ่งมันจะโปรเจคชันเลเยอร์เจ็ดไม่ว่าจะเป็น HTTP หรือ HTTPS นะครับจะมีโปรดักอีกตัวเรียกว่า b a s t i o n Host ที่เป็น Solution Data Security Assumption ว่ามีเซิร์ฟเวอร์ประมาณ100หรือ200ตัวในทางด้านฟาร์มที่เกิดขึ้นและมี Developer หรือ Programmer หรือ System Admin ที่จะคอยทำ Transaction ในการที่จะ Execute Command ผ่านไปยังเซิร์ฟเวอร์ดังกล่าวเราก็ต้องมีตัว Host คล้ายๆกับจำเซิร์ฟเวอร์ที่คอย Protection Screen ว่าคำสั่งที่เข้ามาเนี่ยมัน Authorize หรือเปล่าจำกัดใน User Defined Login แล้วก็ Permission Allocation อย่างเช่นจะ RM File หรือว่าจะ Restart Server จะมี h i e r a r c h y การ Approve ของ Command ตรงนี้เกิดขึ้นด้วยเรียกว่า b a s t i o n Host แล้วก็อันนี้ก็คล้ายๆกับ IAM ของ Google Cloud Platform หรือว่า AWS ที่เป็น IAM เราจะมีเรียกว่า multi authorization and control ที่เรียกว่า RAM resource management ก็คือใช้ในการ user authentication มายังระบบ Cloud ไม่ว่าจะเป็น resource ที่เป็น IaaS PaaS หรือ SaaS นะครับนอกจากนี้ก็จะมี Cloud Disk Security มี SSL มี certification มี HTTP DNS แล้วก็มีพวก disaster recovery uh, security ด้วยนะครับ uh, อันนี้ก็เป็น SSL เดี๋ยวจากหน้าหลักอันนี้จะเป็น overview แล้วผมจะลงรายละเอียด product แต่ละ product ไปนะครับเดี๋ยวก่อนอื่นขอให้แอดไลน์เป็นเป็น,เป,นเพื่อนก่อนนะครับเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวจะแอดเลยก็ได้นะครับ Could you please add line friend and uh, we can continue to next topic deep down in each product โอเคโอเคโอเค right yeah. say hello in like group ด้วย first one can get t-shirt f l o k you can monitor who's first one <laughs> ready no 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 not not finish yet <laughs> อันนี้ก็จะมาเป็น Product ที่เรียกว่า Anti DDoS Service จะมี DDoS กับ DoS นะครับต่างกันยังไง uh, DoS คือการ Attack จาก One Point จากเครื่องเครื่องเดียวไปยังเครื่องเซิร์ฟเวอร์ตรงนี้เราสามารถเอา Filter Malicious Session โดยการสามารถ Queue Session ได้แต่ Anti DDoS เนี่ย DDoS เนี่ยเป็น Distributed Deny of Service จะเป็นการ Control Botnet ไปยังเครื่องคอมพิวเตอร์ที่เป็นเครือข่ายที่โดนมาแวร์หรือว่าพวกโชจันอะไรที่ถูกควบคุมไปแล้วเครื่องเหล่านั้นเมื่อถูกควบคุมมันจะมาโจมตีเครื่องเป้าหมายได้ทําให้เป็นเน็ตเวิร์กในการโจมตีดังนั้นการที่เราจะป้องกันการโจมตีตรงนี้มันค่อนข้างยากมันก็เลยต้องใช้โปรดักต์ที่อยู่ในคอมเมอร์เชียลโปรดักต์เช่นของของคาวแฟร์ของ AWS หรือของ Google แต่ว่าเหล่านั้นทําโดยโปรดักต์เป็น OEM ของเรามีแอนตี้ดีเอสเซอร์วิสของเราเองครับก็สามารถ protect large volume แล้วก็ high rate ด้วย low cost แล้วก็มี large population ได้แล้วก็จะมีการ protect ทั้ง layer 4และ layer 7 layer 4ก็ผ่าน TCP UDP layer 7ก็เป็น HTTP HTTPS แล้วก็ HTTP to web socket ผ่านมายัง uh, allocate resource ของ Alibaba Cloud protect ระดับ domain นะครับตรงนี้อันนี้เดี๋ยวมีคำถามนะครับ <laughs> แล้วก็ Product Anti DDoS เนี่ยจะมี 3-4 Product ดังกล่าวอย่างเช่น Product ที่เป็น Premium จะใช้กับ International Product ที่เป็น Origin ก็จะไม่เปลี่ยนไปแปลง IP Product ที่เป็น Game Shield ก็เหมาะสำหรับ Gaming Industry Solution สำหรับลูกค้าที่มีเซิร์ฟเวอร์อยู่ในจีนก็ใช้ Anti DDoS แบบ Basic ก็ได้นะครับอันนี้จะเป็น Infrastructure ที่เป็น Anti DDoS Layer ด้านบนก็จะเป็น Ali Cloud Resource ด้านตรงกลางก็จะเป็น Anti DS Network Service มี BGP Cross Network Connection แล้วก็มี 
ป้องกัน on premise IDC ได้ด้วยนอกจากจะป้องกัน on cloud แล้วจะป้องกัน on premise IDC ได้ด้วยครับแล้วก็อันนี้จะเห็นจะเห็นว่าที่ใกล้เคียงของเราที่สุด anti d e d e r service offering ก็จะมีมาเลเซียแล้วก็สิงคโปร์นะครับที่เป็นที่เป็น mitigation center scrubbing center ในการที่จะ mitigate bad traffic ไปยังเซิร์ฟเวอร์ที่เป็น origin server อันนี้คือจะเป็น architecture การ protection ก็คือจาก malicious ผ่านเข้ามาก็จะผ่าน cloud font หรือ cdn ไปก่อนเพื่อจะ filter ตรงส่วนนั้นแล้วก็จะมี ai ที่ใช้ในการ learning pattern ในการโจมตีเพื่อไม่ให้มาโจมตีซ้ำอีกครั้งในรูปแบบ pattern เดิมๆแล้วก็จะเป็นการเรียนรู้แบบ reinforcement เพื่อให้ engine มีการเรียนรู้เพิ่มมากขึ้นและมี database ที่เก็บพวกพวก pattern เหล่านี้โดยมีการทำ file grain rule หรือ acl อะไรพวกนี้แล้วก็จะเก็บเป็น log เพื่อจะไม่ให้ยูเซอร์นั้นอะมาถูกโจมตีอีกครั้งหนึ่งด้วยแพทเทิร์นเดิมๆครับแล้วก็อันนี้ขอข้ามไปแล้วกันนะครับมันค่อนข้างเทคนิคอลหน่อยก็อันนี้ก็ถ้า under the door sack tag มันก็จะมีผ่านอินเทอร์เน็ตได้แล้วก็ผ่านมา IDC ของตัวเองอันนี้คือเป็นการโจมตีแบบว่า on premise แต่นี้เป็นมีการ protect แบบ on cloud normal traffic normal traffic ก็จะเล่ามายังอินเทอร์เน็ตมายังเซิร์ฟเวอร์ของเรา bad traffic ก็จะถูก mitigate ไปยังที่เป็น uh, scrubbing center ครับนอกจากนี้ยังมี game shield ที่เป็น protection สำหรับเฉพาะที่เป็น gaming industry จะ enhance security service โดยกระจายตามโนดโดยการเราทำเป็น Kubernetes cluster เพื่อจะ running พวก service ที่ใช้ในการทำพวก game shield service นะครับครับมีคำถามอะไรเกี่ยวข้องกับ uh, anti d o s service we have a question related anti d o s service I can show in console how to uh, enable our anti d o s service อันนี้ก็จะเป็นหน้าคอนโซลของ Alibaba Cloud นะครับเวลาเราจะใช้งานโปรดักต์ของ Alibaba Cloud แล้วก็มาที่เว็บไซต์ Alibaba Cloud com แล้วเราก็ล็อกอินผ่านยูเซอร์ที่เราสมัครแล้วจะเห็นได้ว่าโปรดักต์ที่เราใช้งานก็จะอยู่ตรงนี้โปรดักต์และเซอร์วิสถ้าจะเป็นพวกกลุ่มที่เป็น ECS EC2 Elastic Compute Service ก็จะมีตั้งแต่เซิร์ฟเวอร์โหลดบาลานซ์ Auto Scaling Container Service แล้วก็ Simple Application Server แม้กระทั่งฟังก์ชันคอมพิวที่เป็น Lambda คล้ายๆกับ AWS Lambda ก็มีส่วน Networking ก็ไล่มาตั้งแต่ Server Load Balance SLB VPC VPN Gateway Elastic IP Address CDN แต่ในหัวข้อที่เราพูดกันวันนี้เราพูดในเรื่องของ Security ก็จะมี Anti DS Basic Anti DS Basic นี่จะ Mitigate Bad Traffic ที่ต่ำกว่า5 GB ของ Server แต่ละเครื่องออกไปนะครับแล้วก็จะมี Server Guard Security Center มีมี SSL Certification Content Moderator แล้วก็ Cloud Firewall ยกตัวอย่างเช่นเราเราจะใช้งานพวก Anti d d s Service หรือ Anti d d s Pro เราก็จะมาที่ Product นั้นได้เลยแล้วก็ Purchase แล้วก็ระบุโดเมนที่เกาะไว้ได้เลยครับมันก็จะบอกว่า Purchase Instance แล้วก็ Configuration Map กับโดเมนได้เลยคล้ายคลึงกับโปรดักต์อื่นๆเช่นผมขอยกตัวอย่างโปรดักต์ CDN ที่เป็น Content Delivery Network ถ้าเราจะ caching content ของ Origin Server เพื่อจะให้ User Access ได้ไวใน Destination User เราก็แค่มา create uh, CDN Add Domain ระบุ CDN ของ Domain ของเราแล้วก็ระบุว่าเป็น Large File Video On Demand หรือ Dynamic CDN ระบุว่าเป็นจากไซต์โดเมนหรือฟังก์ชันคอมพิวหรือเป็น OSS เป็น Storage Base ตรงนี้ระบุพอร์ตเป็น HTTP หรือ HTTPS ได้แล้วก็แค่5นาทีคลิกก็ก็สามารถ Deploy CDN ได้แล้วนอกจากนี้แพลตฟอร์มของเรายังมี Support Terraform Terraform ในการทำ Provisioning Cloud Ter- Currently Alibaba Cloud has published Terraform for Web GUI คือสามารถช่วยให้ Developer หรือว่า DevOps สามารถใช้งาน Terraform ได้ในรูปแบบของ Web GUI ได้เลยในการ migrate infrastructure as a code นะครับตรงนี้ไม่ต้องมาเขียน uh, HTF f i l ในการ plan หรือ play หรือ apply ตรงนี้มันจะง่ายในการทำงานของเรานอกจากนี้ก็จะมี Open API ซึ่งจะทำงานได้หลาย
เซอร์วิสของอีบาบาคาเช่นเราจะ provision VPC provision RAM หรือสร้าง RDS ก็จะซัพพอร์ตหลายๆภาษาเช่นภาษา Java Node.js Go PHP Python .net แล้วก็ Ruby ครับเดี๋ยวไปที่อีกโปรดักต์หนึ่งอันนี้ security introduction จบละ TBS จบอันนี้จะเป็นอีกโปรดักต์ที่เรียกว่าเว็บแอปพลิเคชันไฟล์วอลเว็บแอปพลิเคชันไฟล์วอลคือการโปรเทคระดับเว็บแอปพลิเคชันระดับเว็บแอปเลเยอร์7ที่เป็น HTTP HTTPS ป้องกันบอทเน็ตคอร์สไซส์คลิปเอ่อ HTTP flood SQL flood SQL injection ก็มันก็จะมี regulation and compliance แล้วก็ industry specific regulation ที่เราต้อง compile ตามแล้วก็มีพวก personal PDPA personal privacy protection ตรงนี้ที่เราต้อง implement w a f ให้กับองค์กรเช่นเดียวกัน w a f ก็มันก็จะมีหลายๆเจ้าที่ทำ w a f แล้วก็ Alibaba Cloud ก็เป็นเจ้าหนึ่งที่เรา protect ระดับ application ก่อนที่จะเข้ามาถึงระดับที่เป็น infrastructure อย่างเช่นคือ w a f ของเราไม่ได้ apply เฉพาะ Alibaba Cloud infrastructure เท่านั้นแต่ควบคุมในส่วนของ Cloud เจ้าอื่นด้วยสามารถอย่างเช่นเรามี infrastructure ของ Google อยู่หรือของ AWS อยู่เราสามารถใช้ w a f ของ Alibaba Cloud ได้เพื่อ indicate ในการที่จะเห็นนั้นพวก security เซอร์วิสตรงนี้นะครับจะมีการทำพวก API Security l o c k Management Bot Management อันนี้คือถ้าเราใช้เซิร์ฟเวอร์ของ Alibaba Cloud เราจะได้ Anti DS Basic ที่1ถึง5กิกฟรีตรงนี้เราไม่คิดตังค์แต่แค่5กิกถ้าเป็นเซิร์ฟเวอร์ขนาดใหญ่ที่มี Workload สูงๆแต่ละวัน Daily Workload ก็จะประมาณ500กิกหรือประมาณเทนึงอยู่แล้วโดยเว็บไซต์ทั่วไปนะครับคีย์ฟีเจอร์หลักของ w a f ของ l i b e r a Cloud คือสามารถมอนิเตอร์ได้เรียลไทม์มีอินเทลเจนต์โหลดบาลานซิ่งจะเป็นราวโรบินหรือเวทเทสราวโรบินหรือจะเป็นเวทเทสลิสเทสคอนเนคชันก็ได้เป็นอินเทลเจนต์เราติ้งซีโร่เดย์โปรเทคชั่นไฮบริดคลาวด์โปรเทคชั่นสามารถโปรเทคได้ทั้งออนเพรมส์และก็ออนคลาวด์ในเวลาเดียวกันมีบอทแมネจเมนต์แล้วก็มีเทรดอินเทลเจนต์อันนี้ก็จะเป็นในลักษณะของการไลฟ์ไซเคิลของการทำเรียลไทม์โปรเทคชั่นเบสออนมัลติเพิลเอนจินนะครับอันนี้ผมไม่ขอลงรายละเอียดแล้วกันครับอันนี้ก็เป็นไฮไลท์ของ g l o b a l โหลดบาลานซ์ SLB ที่จะสามารถอินดิเกตกับ w a f ได้แล้วก็เรามีส่วนของที่ทำ Big Data Analysis ในการที่จะฟีดแบ็กพวก Ethics Hacker ในการเก็บของ Library เพื่อจะเพื่อจะเป็น Library บอกว่าเอ้ยเว็บไซต์นี้โดนโจมตีจากประเทศไหนบ่อยๆอันนั้นเป็นรีพอร์ตออกมาเพื่อจะแจ้งให้กับลูกค้าทราบครับวาฟก็จบลงละเดี๋ยวขอไปหัวข้อสุดท้ายสำหรับเรื่องวาฟมี do you have any question no yes โอเคโอเคคันนี้ซีเคียวริตี้เซ็นเตอร์เดี๋ยวผมจะขอไปดูที่วาฟหน้าจอคอนโซลให้นะครับถ้าเราจะเปอร์เชสแอปพลิเคชันไฟล์วอลเราก็จากหน้าจอที่เป็น Alibaba Cloud ก็คือเราก็เข้าง่ายๆเลยบนเว็บ alibaba cloud com เราก็ล็อกอินตรงนี้พอล็อกอินปุ๊บมันจะมีคอนโซลตรงนี้เราก็จะมาเลือกโปรดักต์และเซอร์วิสพิมพ์ว่าวาฟมันก็จะขึ้นมาว่าเว็บแอปพลิเคชันไฟล์วอลเว็บแอปพลิเคชันไฟล์วอลของเราจะซื้อไว้สำหรับ protection เป็นแบบ international waf ก็ purchase subscription ได้ตรงนี้ก่อนที่จะซื้อเราจะมีการ estimation pricing of the product ด้วยก็คือมาที่ support แล้วก็ pricing calculator อย่างเช่นเราต้องการจะซื้อ security product w a f firewall สำหรับ pro business หรือ enterprise ถ้าเป็น China mainland ก็เลือกตรงนี้ถ้าเป็น international outside China ก็จะเลือกตรงนี้แล้วก็เป็น pro หรือ business plan ก็แล้วแต่จะเลือกนะครับว่าจะ protect เป็นแบบมี
บนด์วิดคลีนทราฟิกเท่าไหร่หรือให้ทีทีฟัดมิติเกชันไซส์เท่าไหร่เอ็นเตอร์ไพรส์มันก็จะเพิ่มขึ้นมาอีกบิสเนสก็จะอย่างเช่น200เมก100เมกเอ็นเตอร์ไพรส์ก็จะเพิ่มมาเป็น1กิกหรือ1เทอะไรเงี้ยแล้วแต่เราเลือกไพรส์มันก็จะขึ้นที่ตรงนี้เลยว่าเราซื้อเป็นแบบอย่างเช่นตัวนี้ก็จะเป็น299เหรียญมีเอ็กซ์ตร้าโดเมนปะก็ถ้ามีเอ็กซ์ตร้าโดเมนแล้วก็ใส่ไปตรงนี้มีเอ็กซ์คลูซีฟไอพีเอ็กซ์ตร้าทราฟิกที่เราต้องการเท่าไหร่ต้องการโมบายโปรเทคชั่นด้วยหรือเปล่าถ้าโมบายโปรเทคชั่นด้วยก็คลิกเยสเป็นวันมันหนึ่งปีหรือ2ปีก็จะมีให้เลือกเป็นแบบวอลิเดชันเพเรียดเราก็จะสามารถคำนวณได้ว่าเฮ้ยโปรดักที่เราจะต้องเพอร์เชสอ่ะมันราคาเท่าไหร่นะครับถ้าเลือกเป็นวันเดียร์ซับสคริปชันเบสมันก็ราคามันก็จะดิสคาวลงมาค่อนข้างเยอะ3 0ถึงครับแล้วก็สำหรับโปรดักอื่นๆอย่างเช่นตัวอันตี้ดีดอสพรีเมียมอันตี้ดีดอสพรีเมียมนี่ก็จะเป็นโปรดักที่ใช้ในระดับอินเตอร์เนชั่นแนลก็คือนอกเหนือเมลแลนด์ไชน่าจะมีทั้งอินชูรันส์และก็อัลลิมิเต็ดแพลนเราก็เลือกถ้าอินเลมิเต็ดแพนนี้ก็คือไม่จำกัดการโจมตีต่อเดือนถ้าเป็นอินชูรันเนี่ยก็จะจำกัดแค่หนึ่งครั้งแล้วก็เพิ่มขึ้นให้อีกหนึ่งครั้งคือไม่เกิน2ครั้งต่อเดือนมันก็จะมี pricing ที่ที่ลิสต์ออกมาตรงนี้ต่อเดือนว่าเท่าไหร่ราคาก็ออกมาถ้าเราเพิ่มแบนด์วิดไปจาก100เป็น200ราคามันก็จะเพิ่มขึ้น calculation ไปนะครับตรงนี้ถ้าสนใจ implement เนี่ยเราอาลีบาบาคลาวเราจะมีพาร์ทเนอร์ช่วยในการ implement ให้แล้วก็สามารถจบได้ภายใน1วีคหรือ2วีคแค่นั้นเองในการ implement security service แล้วก็ service และ product อื่นๆที่เราสามารถ calculation ได้ก็มีทั้งไม่ว่าจะเป็น server storage database หรือแม้กระทั่งพวก traffic transfer นะครับอันนี้ไม่ทราบว่าใครมี Alibaba Cloud account แล้วบ้าง has anyone used Alibaba Cloud before or just the first time First r i g h t <laughs> Okay. Okay. The last topic today is uh, about security center. เดี๋ยวผมขอเดโมให้ดู security center product. Security center product นี่เป็นคือคล้ายๆกับเป็นศูนย์กลาง central ในการ management asset ทั้งหมดบน cloud. ไม่ว่าจะเป็น server storage network security vulnerability threat patching หรือ information ต่างๆของ asset ของเราทั้งหมด product นี้เรียกว่า security center ก็จะเป็นการ monitor enterprise workload ไม่ว่าจะเป็นแพลตฟอร์มต่างๆที่อยู่บน Google AWS Cloud หรือ Amazon หรือว่าจะเป็น Alibaba Cloud สามารถ connect กับ security center ได้หมดนะครับอพอดีสไลด์มันค่อนข้าง theory ไปหน่อยผมให้ดูตัวที่เป็นเดโมเลยแล้วกันเซคิวริตี้เซ็นเตอร์แล้วก็เข้ามาที่เซคิวริตี้เซ็นเตอร์มันคล้ายๆกับการไปลงเอเจนต์ในบนเซิร์ฟเวอร์แล้วก็มันจะมอนิเตอร์ฟีดล็อกมาเก็บแล้วก็มอนิเตอร์ได้หมดอย่างเช่นมันจะได้มันจะบอกว่า Uh, total asset ของเรามีเซิร์ฟเวอร์ทั้งหมดกี่ตัวมีอันนี้ของผมยังไม่สร้างอะไรในนี้เลยมี risk assessment เท่าไหร่มี risk server เท่าไหร่ risk website ที่จะต้องต้องการทำ protection เท่าไหร่แล้วก็มี vulnerability ยังไงบ้างกับเซิร์ฟเวอร์เนี่ยต้องลง patch หรือต้องอะไรบ้างมี window system เท่าไหร่ linux system เท่าไหร่นี่เป็น panel ที่สามารถ monitor ทางด้าน security ได้หมดของทั้งองค์กรเลยนะครับอันนี้ก็สามารถ purchase แล้วก็ซื้องานแล้วก็ใช้งาน implement ได้เลยมีการ investigation หลอก analysis การทำ assert fingerprint การทำ operation ต่างๆถ้าถ้าเกิดว่ามี patch ที่ต้องลงก็ทำผ่านหน้านี้ได้เลยครับครับสำหรับ price calculation ก็เหมือนเดิมสามารถเ,าเวลาต้องการ purchase หรือต้องการ make decision ในการสั่งซื้อก็จะมาที่หน้าจอ price calculation เพื่อเพื่อเพื่อทำการ estimate ก่อนว่า budget ขององค์กรเรา OPEC คาเปกเรามีเท่าไหร่ในการตัดสินใจซื้อโปรดักต์ต่างๆเหล่านั้นนะครับโอเคเดี๋ยวผมขอขึ้นหน้านี้ไว้แล้วกันโอเค
ต่อไปก็เป็น Q&A นะครับครับครับเชิญใช้ได้ครับใช้ได้เดี๋ยวผมจะเดโมให้ดูจากหน้าแรกเลยนะแล้วก็เข้าเว็บไซต์อาลีบาบาแล้วก็สมมุติเราจะสร้างเซิร์ฟเวอร์ขึ้นมาเราก็ไปที่ EC CECS ECS Elastic Compute Service ช้าหน่อยตอนเน็ต Wi-Fi เรามาที่ Instant เลือกเป็นใช้หน้าเมนแลนเจ้าที่ฮางโจวเชียงไฮ้เบจิงกินโดอะไรผมอ่านไม่ออกเนี่ยสันเจนสร้างเซิร์ฟเวอร์ที่ไหนก็ได้แล้วก็ create instance จะเอา instance ท้ายไหนเป็น subscription base subscription คือจ่ายรายเดือน2เดือน3เดือน4เดือนเป็น1ปี pay per use pay as you go จะจ่ายเป็นแบบ on demand base แล้วก็ที่สนเจนเนี่ยจะมี availability zone ค่อนข้างเยอะหน่อยรู้สึกจะเป็น6หรือ9จำไม่ได้โซนปกติจะเห็นของ AWS ของ Google จะมีแค่3โซน product แต่ของเราจะค่อนข้างเยอะมากตรงนี้ high quality ค่อนข้างสูงมาก type ของ machine ก็สามารถเลือกได้เป็น x86 ว่าจะเป็น window based linux based storage disk เป็น ssd customer image ก็สามารถเอามาได้หรือว่าจะเป็น centos เป็น linux os เป็น ubuntu debian linux se centos os อะไรเงี้ยเลือกได้หมดหรือจะเป็น share image ที่แชร์มาจากหรือว่าจะเป็น marketplace ที่เราสามารถเลือกได้ว่าจะเป็น lamp stack หรือเป็น ubuntu หรือเป็นอะไรเงี้ยเลือกได้หมดแล้วก็เพิ่มดิสดิสก็อย่างที่รู้อยู่แล้วมี2แบบคือ System d i s กับ Data d i s System ก็เป็น uh, Enhanced SSD เป็น SSD Data d i s ก็ใช้เก็บ Data สามารถทำ Snapshot จาก Snapshot ของ System d i s สามารถมาทำเป็น Image ได้ต่อมีสามารถต่อ NAS File System ได้จาก Snapshot ของ System d i s หรือ Data d i s เราสามารถทำเป็น Period ในการทำ Automatic Snapshot แล้วก็ทำ Policy b a s ในการแบบว่าเอ้ยจะ Backup เฉพาะวันศุกร์ตอนกลางคืนอะไรอย่างเงี้ยก็สามารถทาได้หมดครับเน็ตเวิร์กิ้งแล้วก็เหมือนกับ AWS เหมือนกันก็จะเป็น VPC Security Group VLAN v s w i t c h อะไรเงี้ยครับก็คือเราไม่จาเป็นต้องมี e s t a b l i s h e d Company ในจีนมาก่อนใช่ไหมครับเพราะว่าเห็นอย่าง Correct me if I'm wrong AWS don't allow us to use China region right so we can ถ้าสมมติทำเป็น commercial website เนี่ย if you want to purchase like a good uh, service that have like payment gateway to enter the credit card information in website you have to have like ICP license in order to allow you have a business in China say but normal web server is fine right yeah yeah if just normal web server just to like to show your information just that No like commercial product part or get money from clients. No need to to get ICP license. Thank you. ไม่ทราบอันนี้เนี่ยซัพพอร์ตภาษาสแกลล่าหรือว่าพวก Big Data อย่าง Spark อะไรไหมมีครับมีโปรดักที่เป็นอย่างเช่น AWS จะมี EMR Cluster ที่เป็น Elastic Map Reduce Cluster ที่ลง Spark บน EMR Cluster ได้ในการที่จะลง Jupyter Notebook ให้ Data s c i e n c e เขียนเราก็จะมี Product ที่เป็น Data Intelligence เหมือนกันเดี๋ยวผมพอดีวันนี้ Topic ไม่ได้เตรียมเรื่องนั้นเดี๋ยวผมขอดูก่อนว่ามีหรือเปล่าสักครู่นะครับอ่ะผมเปิดหน้าคอนโซลให้เลยแล้วกันโปรดักและเซอร์วิสจะมีกลุ่มของทางด้านที่เป็น Big Data ก็จะมี Machine Learning AI Data Warehouse Data Lakes เหมือนกันเดี๋ยวผมขออันนี้ก่อนอันนั้นติกโปรดักมี Data Visualization uh, Data Developer Data Works มันก็คล้ายๆกับ AWS Glue ในโลกของการทำ Data เนี่ยมันจะมี4โดเมน Data s o u r c e จะเป็นพวก SAP ERP หรือพวก uh, HR Financial จาก Data s o u r c e เราก็ต้องทำ ETL ในการที่จะทำ Data Extraction มาจาก Data s o u r c e ไม่ว่าจะเป็นเกาะเป็น SAP เกาะเป็น SQL Server เกาะเป็น Oracle 
จาก ETL เนี่ยเรามีทูหลายอย่างเช่น i n f o r m a t i c a t a l e n t หรือไม่ก็ AWS s c r e w ของเราก็จะมี Data Work จาก Data i n t e g r a t i o n มาแล้วเราต้องมีที่เก็บข้อมูลอย่างเช่น Data Lake จะเป็น S3 เป็น Data Chip เป็น a t h e n a อาลีบาบาคาวก็จะมี OSS Object Based Storage จากที่เก็บ Data Storage เราก็ต้องมาทำ Data Processing ตรงนี้เราก็มี Machine Learning และ AI ในการทำ Data Processing ซึ่งพี่ที่พี่ที่ถามผมสามารถดูได้ทางเว็บไซต์ได้เลย Data Visualization l a y e r สุดท้ายในการทำ Data Visualization ในการทำเป็น Dashboard หรือ Report จากค่ายอื่นเช่นมี Click View Power BI หรือ Tableau อะไรเงี้ยซึ่งทางทางเราก็มี Data V Product ตรงนี้ในการทำ Data Visualization ด้วยครับครับ uh, I have a question about yes. the I, I don't know if you can reply as well okay. uh, but let's suppose I deploy something in Alibaba cloud right uh, and I choose like Thailand or another place outside China yes uh, and I I am subject to the China laws because uh, Alibaba is a Chinese company. Can they yes. like shut it down, like my app, uh, uh, for no, some reason? No, we we separate. Uh, in Alibaba, in in mainland China, we have this is this is Alibaba Cloud International. We uh -huh. hosting every information in Singapore. We have okay. two separate sites. If you are Using mainland China, mm -hmm. every single state, you just use Ali Yun platform. Okay. Is this Alibaba Cloud International that you in Australia, Germany, Frankfurt, US okay. West, US North, Mumbai, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, okay. Philippines, that is separate, mm -hmm. separate world. Okay, so if yeah. I'm outside the, the, the rain, don't worry about the, 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 the yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. the okay, trade war you. or anything, don't worry about okay. that. Okay. okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Red your hand, please. ก็ถ้าจะเริ่มต้นใช้ Alibaba Cloud ก็ไม่ยากนะครับก็คือ register Alib the first if you want to use Alibaba platform you just go to alibabacloud.com and uh, register new user and we can get like free tier service. นี่ก็คือฟีเทียของ Alibaba Cloud Service สามารถดูผ่านได้ทางหน้าเว็บไซต์นะครับ You can get up to 16 free trial product 20 plus plus always free product and uh, the credit uh, dollar US dollar in your account If you are registered with enterprise account you can got like uh, 1,300 US dollar for credit that you purchase like our product Credit actually we limitation in one years, right? Uh, data center in Thailand, we we working with the with, with the vendor right now and like uh, soon, hope soon. <laughs> okay. นะครับมีคำถามอะไรอีกบ้างไหมครับยายายา no 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 need in order to sign up you just have an account Alibaba Cloud that you can create any resort in any region in international for is for taxes purpose and invoicing uh yes we have taxes management in our Alibaba Cloud platform already like you have to invoice PRPO something like that right yeah they have expense and management billing Okay. For you. Yeah. If I pick Thailand, you are charging me in Thai baht or in USD. I, in USD. USD. Okay. Thai okay. Thailand is not charged in Thai baht. We okay. charge in always. Even in you are USD. in Singapore or Malaysia or Indonesia, we charge in USD. Okay. Okay. <laughs> are we have local billing if you need?
We have a distributor like iNet, Internet Thailand, and China Mobile to take care of uh, billing service for big customer in Thailand also. Okay, go. Okay, so um, you may, did, um, I, I asked a question like you don't want to know um, what's the code here in the shirts? The front yeah, the front one here. Yeah, is it got right? But don't you curious about what's this writing about? Right, you guys know that? Oh no. Okay, I tell you what. This code, meaning of the first draft code of our Epsora stack. Yeah. Epsora stack. So the, the Epsora stack is mean like um, we have the our own stack that developed by our engineer at Alibaba Group. We call Epsora stack. Yeah, this is the meaning of the shirt that I want to so you guys to, to to know and to re remember us. Yeah. Okay. Samrapom Sun Head of Social Analytics Alibaba Cloud Thai Thailand. ก็ขอจบเพียงแค่นี้ครับถ้ามีอะไรก็สอบถามมาทางไลน์หรือทางอีเมลได้ครับยินดีให้คำปรึกษาครับ Okay. So you guys, um, sorry, so you guys add us the, as a live friend already, right? So if you go back to the line window chat, line chat window, we also have the next event called Epsora Bangkok, Epsora Chat Bangkok, sorry, which will be held in here again on 12th of November, start from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Yeah, if you are free to, jo uh, if you're free, uh, please you guys join us at that event. Yeah, maybe see you guys in the uh, next week. All right, thank you.